welcome to History Through Fiction, the podcast. I'm your host, Colin Mustful, and today I am thrilled to be joined by Elizabeth R. Anderson, author of The Alewives. Hi, Elizabeth. Thanks for joining me. Hi, thanks for having me. Well, I want to start with The Alewives. Who are they? When and where do they live? And what's going on in their lives? Right. So The Alewives are three women. They are completely fictional. And they are living in the Alsace region of um, Europe, which is sort of currently located in modern day France, but it, you can figure that it's right on the border of France and Germany on the Rhine River. They are living in um, the mid 14th century and the great first wave of the Black Death has just passed through the region. Um, and so they are in a period of shock and recovery, like the rest of Europe at that time. And I would venture to say, much like what we are experiencing now post pandemic in the 21st century. Um, and the really unique thing about them is that they are very much they're very local they live in a place called colmar which is a real location in alsace and they are not royalty they are not wealthy they are very normal women who are just kind of trying to get by in a very difficult time socially and economically in um, this part of the world so yeah well, the, the next thing that, that I wanted to know more about, I am not a beer drinker. Can you tell <laughs> me what's the difference between ale and beer and what was the role of ale in this society? Absolutely. Right. And, and I'm glad that you know that there is a difference between beer and ale, because I think a lot of people nowadays don't recognize the difference between the two. Um, so uh, obviously, I think a lot of people who study history will know that beer and ale are essential to human civilization. There's theory that it might even be the reason why um, humans stopped their nomadic existence, which was to um, be able to grow grain and brew um, beer and ale so that they had um, this sort of safe, um, uh, a little bit more sterile liquid, um, hygienic liquid that they could drink um, and it would keep them from getting sick. So ale was extremely important in society. It was a safe beverage. Um, the brewing process would remove a lot of bacteria that could cause harmful diseases. Um, ale was uh, very light in alcohol for the most part. People would drink it for breakfast. Um, it would be maybe 1% or 2% alcohol. So very, very light. Um, children drank it everyone drank it and they would also make stronger versions as well and one of the things that makes ale unique from beer which is what we mostly drink nowadays is that ale did not have a prevalence of hops or hop flour in the brew um some of that was just due to preference and taste hops add a lot of bitterness ale was made out of water um, a grain, a locally available grain. So in the case of the alewives, it would have been barley and, and a little bit of wheat. Um, uh, yeast, which was often naturally um, occurring in the environment, the yeast would live, you know, in the air on surfaces or on the fruit or the grain that was used in the brew. So I didn't really understand what yeast was yet. Um, and then they also had uh, um, herbs and oftentimes the herbs they would use would be rosemary, um, heather flower, uh, bog myrtle, a little bit of hops. And um, that was a concoction of um, a blend of herbs called groot that would be added to the brew and the groot was taxed by the local government or by the local monarch. And, um, and that was how they would um, sort of regulate who was making ale and who um, was making ale illegally. And hops, when hops were introduced, um, they really became prevalent in the 16th century, but they were being used before that. Hops added a um, 
uh, hops helped preserve the ale. So they noticed that when they were adding a really large amount of hops to the brew, it didn't go off as quickly because ale would spoil after a couple days. Um, and hops changed the not only the industry of brewing, but it also changed, I'd say, society because what was going on before this was that women would brew ale in their homes and they would brew it for their families. And if they had any left over, they could sell that and they could keep the profit. And this was their own cottage industry. This is the way that they could make their own money without necessarily having to work for their husband or work for someone else. Um, when hops came along right around the time of the, the Black Death, this was when ale became portable, became beer, was easier to store because it lasted longer because the hops would preserve the liquid. And this was meant when men really started to come in and become um, large scale brewers and, and brewing of ale ceased to be something that women did in their home and it became something that men would do as an industry. Um, and so in a lot of ways, hops sort of pushed women out of the brewing industry and um and it sort of changed their role in society in a lot in in central europe um so uh there is a big difference um ale tastes very different um and you know it's a it's a fascinating beverage that has been with humans for a very very long time and is responsible for i think the growth of society <laughs> it's, that's, yeah, that's a pretty, uh, I mean, I, I understand where you're coming from as far as uh, agri when agriculture was established and, and making beverages like that with, the, with the, the wheat and the barley. Um, I'm just, just from hearing you describe all that, it sounds, I mean, it sounds like you have an extensive knowledge in all of it. Have you done it yourself? Have you had a chance to brew some ale yourself? Yes. Yeah. Um, I do have root herbs in my house um, that I've sourced from all over the place. I have brewed myself. Um, results were mixed. And <laughs> that's um, kind of something that's reflected in the story as these three women learn how to brew ale and how to support themselves. They do some experimentation. Some of it's an absolute failure. Um, and that was my experience. I also, um, my father and my brother are brewers. My father makes wine. He makes mead. He makes ale. He makes beer. And, and so does my brother. So it's something that we do a lot in my family just um, as a hobby as well. Yeah. Well, I, I want to ask you more about the connection you already made between the Black Death and the aftermath of that and the period we're in now um you know recovering from the pandemic and now in an endemic um what I, another thing that strikes me as kind of curious is we we published a novel at history through fiction called the king's anatomist that took place in the 1400s and one of the characters has they're dealing with the the plague and i was surprised at how similar it was 500 years ago some of the same basic tactics of quarantining and mm -hmm. things like that so in your research, I'm, I'm curious to know what connections could you draw between that time period and this time period, and then what yeah. differences were there? Um, yeah, so this book really came out of my experience going through the pandemic um, because I had already some knowledge of the Black Death, just, you know, curiosity. Um, and then when we went through our own global pandemic, I started to see those similarities pop up. Um, some of the things that I think are very interesting, um, after the Black Death, it, I mean, technically, the, the wave that came through in the 1300s, the mid-1300s, was not the first wave of plague. So there was the plague of Justinian, which, you know, it came a lot earlier than that. This was um, a globally devastating disease that wiped out. Some people say that they think it wiped out a third of the population of the planet. There's really no accurate estimate. Um, and what struck me was just how it had these social implications. So after the Black Death, swept through the world, um, 
it kind of brought about a change in the way people who worked interacted with their employers or their overlords. Um, it could be considered the reason why feudalism started to decline. Um, because what happened was you just had a massive reduction in population. People who owned a lot of land needed uh, individuals to work that land for them. And there were fewer people around to work the land. So it really flipped the equation of uh, a, a rich person who had all the power um, would dole it out to poor people and pay them almost nothing. It really flipped that equation on its head. It became an employee's world. It really empowered more average people to go back to their employers and say, I'm going to charge you more um, because I can, because you don't have the help that you need. Um, and so I thought that was very interesting. Um, there was a lot of social unrest that happened at around that time. Um, so when you think about, um, I'd say, you know, books like in the Game of Thrones series and the Song of Fire and Ice series, and it's very, you know, everyone's just sort of brutal and they're all just murdering and there's highway robbery. Um, that isn't really something that was a problem and as much um, before the plague. But after the plague, there was just this kind of like socially difficult time. I mean, you, you had a lot of very desperate people. There was um, a lot more, it was a lot more, it was a much more dangerous world. Um, you had entire towns and villages that were depopulated and were completely empty um, because everyone had died. So um, people had to grapple with what was going on, with the horrors that they had seen, but they also had to move on with their lives and try to rebuild. And when I wrote the book, it just kind of felt like that's where we were, right? There was a lot of social um, unease happening in the United States where I live. There were, um, uh, there were economic uh concerns people were worried about the cost of food people were worried about their um, employment status um it was just there were a lot of parallels there well let's move on from that and talk more about the novel itself uh it's funny and i think he <laughs> is very it was done very intentionally um, and I would say it's it's kind of a quick read as well. Uh, so talk about the reasoning behind that and how and why you accomplished that. Yeah, and thanks for mentioning that. Um, I was intentional about that. I wanted it to be something light. So uh, like I said, this book really came out of my experience with the pandemic. Um, everyone struggled during the COVID-19 pandemic and I was no different. Um, and I just found that the world felt so dark. Um, and there was just, everything was just heavy and dark. And I, I was reading and these dark novels and I was writing another series at the time, um, which is, it's set in 13th century Palestine. It's very dramatic. It's this saga of this family that goes through all these terrible things. And I was just getting so, feeling so heavy. And so I wanted to just have a side project that was able to look at a really serious situation and find the, find the light. And that's why I wrote this book the way I did. I intentionally kept it short. Um, because I didn't want people to feel like it was a, um, a chore, right? I wanted it just to be something that they could snack on. Um, I intentionally had the alewives, um, be kind of ridiculous, um, because I really wanted to emphasize their friendship and their rapport with each other. And I wanted people to read it and just come away feeling a little bit happier and thinking, you know, people went through a post-pandemic struggle hundreds and hundreds of years ago, and they managed to hang on to their humanity and their humor. And, and I wanted to do that too. And, and I'm working on the second book. Um, I'm finishing it up. 
Um, it's going to be published on April 19th and it's the same. And my, my beta readers, my pre-readers have been telling me, um, that it's just like seeing old friends again. They're like, they're fun. They're still funny and they're still ridiculous. And, um, they're just like, it's kind of like meeting up with a friend because it's a friend you can joke around with. So you mentioned that this is a series. You have another series that you, you briefly described there. Let's go back to and kind of build up to to talking more about each series. Yeah. Um, it doesn't seem like you've been doing this for all that long. I don't know your whole background. Like maybe you wrote your first novel when you were five. <laughs> um, but, you know, you have a background in journalism. I don't know if you, you didn't publish your first novel until maybe 2021. So yeah. tell me about... Uh, that journey for you of becoming a historical novelist. Right. Um, yes. So I, I have a very um, unique background. <laughs> um, I did get a degree in journalism, um, but I have worked in tech for most of my career. Uh, and I think that in a way that prepared me for um, the experience of writing these books, because first of all, the journalism has helped me with research skills, um, helped me to really dig deep to be able to call up um, professors and, and sources and, and ask them the questions that I need to ask. Um, and I, I've always had a lifelong fascination with, with history, especially um, ancient and medieval history. That's where I'm really have always been focused my whole life. Um, working in tech as a woman made me very, very thick skinned when it comes to feedback. And so I can go through and I can read all the feedback from my editors. I can read all of the reviews from the people who post things online and I am not ruffled by it. <laughs> so, um, I like to think of my past experience as contributing to, um, the, you know, the, the journey I've been on with becoming a novelist. Um, my first series is, uh, I'm working on the fifth book in that series right now. And yes, I started it. I actually started it in 2018. I started the research a couple years before I published the first book. Um, and it is set, uh, in, it starts in 1290 in, um, in Palestine at the end of the Levantine Crusades. And it follows four characters who come from four very different backgrounds, very different religions, and it sort of weaves their stories together as they negotiate this very tumultuous time um, in history that not a lot of people really talk about. But it was when um, the West was sort of kicked out of the Middle East and um, the West had to figure out how to deal with their failure. Um, and in um, the Mamluks, who had uh, conquered them and, and pushed um, the Crusaders out of Palestine, um, you know, they were just starting to really rise to power. And it was such a fascinating time. Um, but like I said, it was heavy. It was, it's a heavy story. Um, and so it was a real delight to take a break from that and just try something different. And, and the thing about the Alewives series is they're standalone books, so you don't have to read them consecutively. Um, my other series, which is called the Two Daggers series, you definitely want to read those in order. Um, with the Alewives books, you can just pick them up at you know whichever book you want. Um, the Two Daggers series, uh, I've got actually got one of the books right here. This is book number one. Um, this series will be five books long. Um, the Alewives series, this is the first book in that series, doesn't really have, uh, I don't really cap in the number of books. I'm just writing them. Um, and I, I like to say it's like a medieval Agatha Christie, you know, like you just pick up like Hercule Poirot or something <laughs> and pick up whichever one you want and read it. Let's talk a little bit about the business of publishing and writing. <laughs> what have you been learning uh, along the way? And how do you get so much done? How are you so productive <laughs> with your writing process? Thank you. Um, so uh, realizing that I'm speaking with a publisher, I am actually self-published. I'm an indie author. Um, and I made that decision very consciously 
Um, I never searched for a publisher. I did not even query one publisher. And the reason for that was because I have, um, I have a professional experience in marketing. Granted, it's in the tech world, but I really wanted to do it as an experiment to see what is this industry all about? Um, how, how far can I get with this? And, um, and just to be able to have a lot of control over what I was doing um, myself and to learn. Um, and so it's been a challenge, um, very much running my own business, running my own press. Um, I had to learn how to, I, I, th I thought I knew about book marketing. I did not. I, I knew about tech marketing. There's very little overlap. <laughs> They're very different things. And so um, I really threw myself into it and just had to learn the industry from the ground up. Um, I would work my um, tech job during the day and then I would start writing in the evenings at around 8 p.m. Um, when my son would go to bed and I would write until one in the morning. Um, and then the next morning I get up, you know, get him ready for school, um, go work my day, not think about my book if I could, if I could manage to do that and then do it all again the next day. I'd spend every hour of my weekends working on the business side of things. So setting up the website, um, learning how to do layout, which I had to learn <laughs> um, and um, learning just about the ins and outs of publishing. And now it's gotten to a point where um, I understand the business side enough that I can keep a sort of steady hum of the um, the marketing going. It's always changing, which I like because it's always a fun challenge. I'm always learning something new. The writing has slowed down. Um, and part of that is just because of personal circumstances, change, change in personal circumstances. It's made it my um, my uh, her, my home life a little bit more strenuous. So I was writing about two and a half books a year and now I'm, I am at one book a year. Um, and I still have that rhythm where I work my regular job during the day. And then in the evenings after my son goes to bed, I do the writing. And then on the weekends, um, I am working on the business side. <laughs> so it's a lot, it's a lot to juggle. <laughs> Do you have time to sleep? Um, let's, can you see the bags under my eyes? <laughs> uh, you definitely have a lot to be proud of. And even, I mean, one book a year, that's, that's a lot by itself. So I, I, I don't think Thanks. you're slowing down. You're just finding your rhythm, maybe. Finding my rhythm. Yeah. <laughs> Well, let's talk a little bit about your personal life. Not too personal. I just want to talk about the Pacific Northwest. Yeah. Uh, where, where are you living? What do you love about it? That kind of stuff. Right. So um, I live in the Puget Sound area. Um, I was born here. I spent a lot of my life living away from this area. I lived in British Columbia. I lived in Thailand. I've lived in Europe. Um, I have spent a lot of time traveling. I did not expect to end up living in the Pacific Northwest again, um, not because I didn't want to, but because I just thought I was going to be, you know, a citizen of the world. Um, but it is wonderful. I mean, if you love the outdoors, this is such a wonderful place to live. I'm 20 minutes away from um, a, a skiing mountain. I am 20 minutes away from hike places where I can hike, which I love to do. I spend a lot of time in the mountains. Um, we have a rainforest, we have a desert, we have ocean, we have mountains. I mean, it's just like whatever you want is sort of here. We also have earthquakes. Um, <laughs> um, and so it's a, a beautiful place. The weather is rainy, especially these days, because we're recording this in January or February, I guess it's now February. But when you are an author, those rainy days are fantastic for just you know, getting cozy, reading a book or writing a book. Um, and then our summers are beautiful. So I actually really love it here. Um, I know it's not for everyone, but it is a very naturally beautiful place. I don't know how long I'll stay here, but for now it's a good place for me and my son. Yeah. I went hiking in Olympic National Park a few years ago and I yes. was not 
I was not prepared for the rainforest part. <laughs> I, I was so surprised. And I, you know, the first, the first part of the hike, I was just constantly wet until I got into the higher elevations. Yeah. <laughs> and then I got to experience the coastal part of it as well, which is another landscape all on its own. And I also went on a primitive trail, which is mm -hmm. like not maintained. I saw mm -hmm. seven bears in the mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and scary. What, yeah. What are your favorite hikes? Oh gosh, it's hard to choose. Um, so I tend to go hiking more in the Cascade Range. Um, the Olympic Range where you were is so beautiful, but I do have to take a ferry or I, I have to drive around a large um, uh, Puget Sound area to get to those hikes. So it does take me longer to get to them. Um, I think I, I absolutely love hiking around Mount Rainier and Mount St. Helens. Um, we have these big volcanoes in Washington state. And of course, Mount St. Helens is really fascinating because it is still, it's post explosion. Um, it blew up in 1980. And um, so you can just really see all this fascinating geological stuff. All the trees are flattened in one direction. Um, you know, you can just see the enormity of this blast, but it's also recovering and you can see that recovery. So you walk through there, you see the trees are growing back. There's wildflowers everywhere. Mount Rainier is absolutely stunning. Um, it is just, it is a really beautiful place. Um, there are fields of wildflowers that are just way up high on the mountains. So you can stand in these meadows surrounded by all this color. And then you can just look out and you can see nothing but snow capped peaks, you know, as far as you can see, it's just beautiful. Um, so I spend as much time as I can in the mountains. Um, and, uh, there are some, a lot of hikes on the eastern side of our mountain range that I love to do as well. And those are completely different. It's sagebrush, um, desert snakes, you know, it's just very, very different, um, but also extremely beautiful as well, because we have the uh, Columbia River Gorge. And so there's just like this, these big, you know, cracks in the earth that have um, beautiful, beautifully colored rocks. And it's, it's really an interesting place. Yeah. It so sounds amazing. I can't wait to go back. Yeah. <laughs> so let's bring it back, uh, to your novel, the oh. ale wives, uh, you sent me a copy. Thank you so much for that. And now oh. in April, you have the, the second, is it the second book in the series? Slight yes. of hand. Yes. Are you working on the third? So I am not working on the third yet although i do have it um it's not fully plotted i just say it's uh i have the concept and so i know i know what the story is going to be um like i mentioned i do have another series and i have to finish that series because my readers are um impatient <laughs> so i'm getting a lot of um impatient uh emails from and and messages on social media um so i'm going to Sleight of Hand will be published on April 19th, and I already have the final book in my Two Daggers series started, and then I will publish that one, and then I will get the next Alewives book going at around the same time, because the Alewives books are, they're less research, they're less, um, the writing is a lot easier. Um, I use more casual language in the Alewives book, I'd say more accessible language. Um, they go a little faster. The Two Daggers series uh, requires heavy, heavy research, and the language is a little bit more formal. It's a little bit more um, like you don't use any contractions, you know, um, and so that is a little bit more work. Um, so that's what my plan is. And then I do have a couple of other projects in mind. Uh, I don't want to talk about them quite yet, but I'm very excited about one standalone book that I am considering that's actually going to be set in the um, the 18th century. I also am thinking about a new blog uh, that will be a short story project as well. So I have so many wheels spinning and not enough time during the day to get it all done. Yeah, and it's just exhausting hearing you say it all. <laughs> well, 
Uh, congratulations, Elizabeth, on the Alewives. Just a great, funny historical novel, <laughs> Thank and you. All, all the work that you're you're doing and and building up your audience and uh, reaching readers with some really great books. Thank you. It's been a lot of fun, and um, congratulations on History Through Fiction. I am the more I learn about your authors and the work that you're doing, I'm just very impressed. Um, I'm actually, uh, I'm friends with a couple of your authors and, um, and so I'm just, uh, I love what you're doing. I love that you're supporting the historical fiction community. Um, and it's such a unique group of very, very smart people who are so passionate about the topics that they write about. And so I love that you are here for them. And I know it's a whole lot of work for you too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can definitely relate. <laughs> well, thanks again, Elizabeth, uh, for having for being on the podcast. And again, congratulations on the Alewives. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.